put it on my bag and got her situated there. We walked to the main doors and there was a, a lady, a security lady. Her first, first comment was to me like, well, get your little girl fixed up or, or something along those lines anyways. And uh, I just told her like, this is not my daughter, this is my wife. And she said, oh, well, we're we'll gonna help. So uh, we did that, the lady put a mask on me and a mask on my wife. And I continued to the next set of the double doors and uh, and uh, went towards the wheelchairs there. And uh, there was another security that came up and asked if she could help. And I just need a wheelchair for her. So I started to grab one of the, the bigger, wider ones, the wheelchairs they have there. The security guy suggested to use one of the narrow ones. I didn't know why, but I'm sure there was a reason that was beyond my my knowledge. So sure, I'll put her in that. So I rolled her up to triage. I, I don't think it took too long to get into triage. Like, I messaged one of my daughters at 11.23 or something like that, that uh, we made it out of triage, we're waiting for a doctor now. So that was fine. We got out of the triage, we did the registration thing, and they asked all the, like, check your address and all this stuff, and that was all fine. And then we, we sat in the waiting room, which is just the open main foyer or whatever four year, however you pronounce that, of the, of the hospital, which, uh, yeah, you can't really see from where the nurses are, there's like a wall and stuff, half wall or whatever. Anyway, so we were there, <clears throat> and then one of the security guards came over and uh, asked if she wanted some water, and yeah, please give us some water. So uh, he brought some water with some ice. She was in pain, like she could she couldn't move herself from the left side to the right side. I had to kind of help her scooch her from one side in the wheelchair to the other, which I thought was quite obvious pain. Um, they did come shortly after and asked for uh, take some blood samples, so pushed her back into the triage room. and The door to the triage room was just barely wide enough for the wheelchair, so I, I did understand why the security guard suggested to use the narrow wheelchair because the bigger one just simply wouldn't have fit in there. So uh, we went back in the triage room and uh, she did take some blood samples, only a few, I don't know, like three or four vials, I don't know. Then we went back out to the waiting room and somebody approached us and asked for a urine sample. So yeah, sure, oh, it looks like a bathroom right across the hall. And so I grabbed the, the bag with the urine sample cup in it and we went to the to the ladies' bathroom across the hall, the security guard said, I think it's empty, and I really didn't care if it was empty or not, I needed a urine sample, so that's where I was going. So I uh, pushed her in there, and there was like two stalls or something. So I pushed her in the wheelchair accessible spot and uh, transferred her, and picked her up out of the chair, took my time, because she was in pain every time I moved her, I touched her, she was in pain. Uh, brought her over, well, pulled, set her up, stand, stood her up, and uh, pulled her pants down, sat her on the toilet. Uh, she was doing her thing, I was catching the sample, I put the cup back on the sample and put it in the bag and throw it in the corner, and get her wiped up and the next step was to get her back in the chair. So I stood her up, I tried to pull her pants up and uh, she slipped and she, she didn't fall, like she, she ended up on the ground, but it was more like a slow setting down because they couldn't couldn't keep up and couldn't get her in the in the wheelchair. I did get the pants mostly up, not all the way. Uh, and I went outside and, and called uh, called for for help. One of the security guards was right there. As he was coming in, I noticed that there was still some some parts showing, so I pulled the pants up the rest of the way. Uh, security guard said, "Thank, thank you." And uh, he said, "I'll be right back." And, and he was back was in no time with another security guard. And uh, the three of us, two security guards and me, got her back into the wheelchair and, and pushed her back out into the, the main lobby there. Where I put her back in the spot we'd been sitting and I went to the front desk and uh, gave them the sample. Uh, the lady asked me if, if there was a name on it and I looked at it and like, there's a label on it but there's nothing written on it. And she said, okay, well, what's the name? So I gave her my wife's name, Allison Holtoff. And, uh, and I told them like, She's getting worse, like, she, she's in pain. I said, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do what we can. I, it was all so much information, I don't even 100% know 
what I said or what she said, but something along the lines like I, I told her she was getting worse. I did from there on on. I, I did talk, talk tell the the triage nurse and and the lady behind the desk at least a couple of times that it was getting worse. She wasn't doing good. She was in pain and. Uh, there was not much of a response. It's, we don't want we can. We don't have any beds. Okay. Uh, I tried to keep my wife comfortable. The security guards brought one blanket, and later on they brought another warm blanket uh, to keep her warm because she was just she looked like shit. And uh, tried to keep her comfortable, rolling her from one side to the other, sitting on one side of her, and then sitting on the other, depending which way she was facing. And uh, at some point she said. She wanted to lay on the floor, so. Well, I don't. If you want to lay on the floor to be more comfortable, that's fine with me. So I took one of the hospital blankets and laid it on the floor next to her wheelchair. And I asked her again, You sure you want to lay on the floor? And she said, Yes. So I picked her up and slowly laid her down on the floor next to the wheelchair on this thin hospital blanket. And she curled up in the fetal position, which is pretty much what she was in the wheelchair the whole time. Um, then somebody else from the waiting room did alert the nurses or somebody, and there was two nurses that did come out um, and said, "What's go?" Asked what's going on, and I, I told them like, "She's in pain." Like, and she asked, "Did you fall?" And I, no, I I put her on the floor. She wanted to be on the floor because she was more comfortable. So. They they seemed to be in a rush, and they were not not necessarily nice about how they handled things. It was more like we need to get you back in the chair, and we got no time. Was my perspective of how they're reacting? Which it's a hospital. There's lots of stuff going on, and they're overworked and underpaid and everything. So can't really blame them. It's a lot a lot going on. It was fairly busy, or it seemed fairly busy. Not sure what they had going on behind the scenes, but there was quite a quite a few people in the waiting room. Anything from a person with a foot in the cast to RCMP officer that, or that brought somebody in with mental stress, I, I assume, and a bunch of older people that were just coming for checkups and just doctor's appointments and all kinds of reasons. There was a, a young lady with a baby who was there, which, thank God, they took them in right away. And, uh, and yeah, so they they put her back in the wheelchair with comments like, you need to help, we're not hurting us to get you back in the chair and stuff. And like, I was thinking to myself, like, you don't need to hurt yourself, I can carry her if that's the issue. Like, let me deal with it if you want to get back in the chair, but anyways. So we got her back in the triage room and uh, in the chair in the triage room and they done the blood pressure and stuff again and as far as I could tell everything looked reasonable uh, the blood pressure was was reasonable the pulse was a little high I thought at 120 ish but uh, she's in pain so you obviously you're having a drill now and stuff so you I would expect the heart rate to be fairly high but I also know medical pressure now. Got a couple of first aid calls, and I've been to a fair amount of calls with the fire department, so I did see a fair amount, but I don't necessarily know what stuff means. Uh, after this, they said that the next bed would be ours, and uh, they're trying to make room. Uh, yeah, so we uh, we went back out to the waiting room. Uh, Allison did ask me to lay back on the floor, and I told her if you want to lay back on the floor, that's no problem. But if we lay you back on the floor, we also have to get you back in the chair to get you to a room if and when we get one. Um, and she thought about it, and she said, no, that was too much pain. That was too much pain. Um, and like it, it was obvious she wasn't paying. It was, to me anyways. She does have a fairly high pain tolerance, so might not be obvious to everybody, but it was definitely, I could tell she was in pain. I knew her, and she was in pain. Uh, from there on, uh, we did wait, I don't know how much longer. We got it there 
11 ish, we got all of the triage at 11 20 something. And uh, I didn't think we got into a room till like closer to three, just before three. Um, but it really was just a room. Like, there was a desk in it, they had the top of the desk was zip tied shut. There was uh, nothing on the desk or in the desk that I remember. <clears throat> there was a chair there. There was a, a sink with soap and paper towel and, and a small garbage can. Uh, the only thing they had really on the wall was the holder where you put the boxes of gloves in with no gloves or nothing in it. So it was really just a room with a desk, a bed, and a chair, and her wheelchair. Um, so once they told me the room go to exam room two, I went in there with her and I I helped out of the wheelchair and I put her on the bed. Um, at some point, I don't remember quite when, some, there was a nurse that did come and, and took some of blood samples, another three or four vials. And uh, I did go quite a few times, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five times to the nursing desk and told them that she was getting worse. And uh, at one point, I did ask for a bedpan because she said she needed to use the bathroom for, for quite a while at that point. And I really didn't didn't want to go through the bathroom ordeal again after last time what happened. Didn't really want to see her on the floor again. And uh, the nurses suggested, well, there's a bathroom here, and like, yeah, I I can't take her there. So uh, so one of the nurses said she's gonna get me a bedpan. So she left, and I went back to the room, and she did come a few minutes later with with the blue plastic thingy for the blood. I don't know, I call it a bedpan holder or whatever it, the actual term may be, and and two cardboard bed pants. So she seemed irritated, the, the lady, and she looked at my wife, and one of the comments was, uh, is she always like this? I'm like, no, she's normal. She's at home, like, this is not her. She's just in pain. And uh, shortly after that, my wife was still on the bed in a fetal position kind of thing, and, uh, and she was rolling the eyes in the back of her head, and. And uh, the nurse asked, like, is she on drugs? And like, no, he... <clears throat> no, she's not on drugs. Like, they just, she hasn't gotten anything from you guys. All she took was a Gaviscon this morning, so. Um, so, and then she fairly quick picked up the bag of her legs, pulled her pants down, and had her laying on the bedpan. And, and she was in pain. She was uncomfortable. Um... Nurse was kind of trying to get her to relieve herself fairly quick, but and made a comment like, "Well, I'm here. You need to deal with this. Your husband can't deal with this." And I don't remember what I told her, but I told her that along the lines that if you need to go do something, I got this. I'm fine. Um, which I changed diapers on a baby before and stuff like that, and and other things as well. So I'm, I'm not necessarily new to this to this stuff. So. Uh, yeah, she took off and she said, let me know when she's done. So I gave her her time. She took quite a while for her to relieve herself because she was in pain and stuff. So, well, when, when she was done, tried to clean her up, but there was really nothing but paper towel from the sink, which was not the neatest. Um, <clears throat> so I got her cleaned up and put the bedpan to the side and it took me a good five to ten minutes to convince her to pull her pants up in case the doctor came in. And she was in pain while, while I tried to get them up. I finally got them up. Uh, and then I went outside the room and I made eye contact with the nurse that, that brought the bedpan. And she looked at me and then she kept looking back at the paperwork, which whatever. They're busy. They got lots of patients and lots of stuff to do. So I made eye contact with her, so I assumed she knew she was done or whatever. I didn't really want to bother them because I'm sure there was, or I thought there was other people in just as much, if not more, distress. And uh, yeah, uh, she kept saying. I think she actually said, started saying that she was felt like she was dying in the waiting room outside. Uh, but but she kept saying it more and more. She said, "I'm 
I feel like I'm dying. They're going to let me die here. And, and I just told her, like, no, that's why they got you in the hospital. They're here to get you fixed up, and we'll just be here. Might be here a day or two, but then we'll go back to normal. No big deal. Been to the hospital multiple times, lots of times with long wait times, but usually you always did end up getting the help in, in a reasonable amount of time, I thought, for what the system is and can provide the way it's set up. But uh, anyways, she was getting worse. I did go up to the nurse's station and did tell them that, that she told me she feels like she's dying. She's getting worse. I don't know what the response was. I don't, I don't really recall, but, but I don't think there was much of a response. I just went back to her room uh, at some point shortly before 6, maybe 5.30, between 5.30 and 6, she started being in more pain. And she started screaming. She was first slowly she was, and quietly, she was saying, help, help. And uh, it was getting louder and louder and until another nurse showed up. I haven't seen that nurse. That was the first time I seen that nurse that day. And she was actually great. She was saying, showing care and compassion, asking what was wrong and what's going on. And I told her what was going on. And she said, OK, well, we'll see what's going on. And she, I'll be right back. And she left and she came back with one of those blood pressure things with the uh, oxygen and stuff. And uh, so I helped her. We got the blood pressure cuff on one of her arms. and. Uh, um, got the oxygen probe on the other one. The thermometer she had was just one of those under the tongue ones in the ER, in the emerge triage thing. They had the, the ear probe, but that machine only had the under the tongue metal probe. And the nurse was saying, like, if I need if you, I need to get your temperature, you, you need to put it under your tongue. And then Alice started biting on it. So she said, you can't bite on it. I can't get a temperature. But then the blood pressure thing was ready, and it was showing pretty low blood pressure. Pulse was still high, but the blood pressure was, was pretty low. And the nurse looked at the machine and looked at me and like, oh, I hate those cuffs. And she readjusted the cuff and she let it run again. And and it was shown right around the same again. I think it was somewhere, pulse was over 100 somewhere. And the blood pressure was somewhere, somewhere around 60 to 40, which I know is pretty low. So. Uh, from there, everything happened pretty quick, and everything, everybody picked up the pace. Uh, she went out with that machine, as, and the light, red light, light flashing on it, and I told her thank you, thank you, because that was the first time I actually feel like somebody was paying attention to us, somebody was was listening to our pain and and what's going on. Um, from there on, the, the nurse came back with another lady, and they right away tried to get. IV into her or like like get the needle in her arm so they can start an IV as soon as as soon as possible I guess and they moved her out of that out of that room to uh, the observation room I think she got observation room one it is just a small area with, with multiple beds divided by like half like walls and curtains and you have like a nurse's desk so that she can I presume monitor multiple critical patients at the same time um, and that area was, was pretty full. Uh, there, I seen the doctor for the first time. Uh, he asked a few questions. He asked if she smoked marijuana, which she did the night before, just a little bit. She didn't smoke a whole lot. I was the smoker, but I couldn't smoke because I was supposed to go back out west and work, so I had to take a drug test. So, but she really only had like a couple puffs of a joint, and she smoked a little bit of her vape pen, which wasn't a whole lot. Made a good night that night. It was pretty good. And uh, also, the doctor asked if, if if she smoked marijuana, and I told him, yeah, she did. And uh, and he suggested, well, marijuana can cause pain or something like that. And I I, I just looked at him and like it's, I don't know. I know marijuana can cause pain and stuff, but that was seemed a little severe for be caused by marijuana. But what do I know? Um, he ordered a bunch of tests and stuff, and they did give her, I think, two liters of IVs of fluids uh, fairly quick, and uh, they did give her something for the pain. At that point, I really thought that the nurses had more knowledge than, than the doctor itself did. But that was just my observation. I don't, I don't really know. I don't know enough medical terms and stuff to, to actually judge that. 
<clears throat> but uh, I did have a little bit after that. I did have a little bit of quiet time behind the curtain with Allison, and, and she just looked at me and said, "Like, like this pain is not from marijuana." She did come around quite a bit in the observation room. Like her, her vitals did come back up once she got fluids, and uh, and her pain was relieved by whatever they given her at the time, at least to a reasonable level, which. No one else, and the sort of pain tolerance is just probably still, still more than I could have handled at any given time. Uh, at that point, she also looked at me and said, "Like, uh, I really appreciated that little, that lady at the entrance uh, called me a little girl," and, and we both had a giggle <laughs> over that, which was pretty much the last happy moment I had with her. That she was in, in somewhat cheer, or happy, I guess. Um, from there, it wasn't much longer until everything pretty much ended. Uh, the x-ray lady came, or I call her the x-ray lady, I don't really know the proper term, and she did untangle some wires to get her ready to get her prepped to, uh, to get her to the x-ray room. Uh, she was hooked up to oxygen, so the, she had to find a bottle to hook up to the bed so we could keep on oxygen for the, for the time she's going to be by the x-ray and get back. So uh, she took off and grabbed the bottle. In that time period, there was another gentleman that, that came and did for the EKG where she obviously was hooked up to the big monitor, but that was like a whole bunch more stickers and stuff on her. And uh, he did eventually, in the end, did get that EKG to work and, and got a reading out of it. And uh, I was holding her hand while he was doing that. And then uh, the x-ray lady came back and uh, I helped her get her situated. And, uh, and we brought it to the x-ray. The, the lady was having the foot end of the bed. I was having the, the, the head of the bed in one hand, like trying to navigate it through the narrow corridors and stuff. And it's, it's pretty crowded in there. It's, there's not much navigating room there, especially when they have people in the hallways and stuff as well. And uh, so I had the, the head end of the bed in one end, and I was pushing her IV drip with the other hand. We went to the x-ray room. And, Everything seemed all right. Um, we got her, she was still laying on the same bed. We got her laying on her side in front of the stand-up x-ray where you, I don't know, where you go and usually you, you hug the machine and they take the chest x-ray. We had her laying on her side in front of that with, with the bed. Uh, took a little bit maneuvering to get her in a decent position. Uh, and I asked about if we had to take the jewelry off, like she was wearing earrings and her wedding band, and the x-ray lady said, no, that's fine, and then Allison chimed in and said that her bra didn't have a wire in it, and then the x-ray lady said, that's great, so we don't have to take that off either. So we just got her positioned, and uh, I tucked her hands, her arms behind the thing, and then the x-ray lady asked me to, to leave the room so she could take the picture, so I did, and when she said, it will be a few minutes, I took that opportunity and went like 50 feet down the hallway to use the bathroom, I had to use the bathroom for quite a while at this point. And uh, took a little break <laughs> and uh, played on my phone a bit. It's, that's when I noticed that somebody else posted on Facebook that they were waiting for like, I don't know, three, four, five hours for an ambulance and ambulance head. So I thought to me, well, great, I did make the right decision not to call the ambulance because I should probably still be sitting at home right now waiting for an ambulance to show up. <clears throat> um, well, that thought didn't last long because as soon as I got back to the x-ray room uh, the door was propped open like six inches so i went in her bed was at this point next to the table they have in there to take the x-rays where you lay down i, I assume um there was the gentleman that took the ekg he was there as well and uh and i was i was at the feed and the x-ray lady was at her head and they were starting to try to move and i tried to move help them move her as well and then she started started to scream in pain, like, I can't breathe, I'm in pain, don't move me, don't move me, I'm in pain. And I went from her feet to next to her side and I was holding her hand and I told her, well, we'll get some pictures and we'll figure out what's going on and then they will get you fixed up, they'll figure out what's going on. And uh, something started beeping, I don't know, it was the, the, the IV drip or if it was the, the other, they put the they pulled the brake out of the out of the big EKG that she was hooked up in the monitor room and took that with her. So I suppose it's just a portable to keep track of of her heart rate and stuff. 
So I don't sure if that's data beeping or it was something on the on the IV drip, but something started beeping and then the next thing you know was she wrenched her chest up on her head and her hips, or like her legs, I don't I don't really know. And I was holding her hand and her eyes were rolling on the back of her head and the X ray lady walked walked behind me somewhere else, and the next thing I hear was, was code blue, code blue in the X ray over the PA system and from there on it was pretty quick that that room was full of people and cars and and I don't really know what. <laughs> um, they asked me to leave the room and uh, across the X-ray room was like a little cubby hole where they have like a like a rack with, with sheets and stuff and there was just a little nook in between there between the wall and the thing and I just sat in there. <laughs> I didn't. They had a waiting room further down but I, I definitely didn't want to go there. I wanted to be as close as possible. If they would have let me, I would have probably stayed in the corner of the room somewhere. But I, I never asked if I could either. So, so uh, they did offer me a chair a couple of times, but I don't like hospitals. I don't like hospital chairs. I just much rather sit in the corner, try to nap. Well, this was definitely not the time to nap, but I don't think I could have napped anyways if I wanted to. Uh, so they did through the blanket she had on her out. Which was a couple of hospital blankets and one we bought home. We bought home, from, we bought from home. My, my daughter gave that to my wife before we left the house. And I, I went over and I grabbed that blanket. I tried to put it on a chair, but they were in a rush and whatever. It's just blankets. So I picked that up off the floor and started hugging it. As I could hear them through the, from across the hallway through the door, calling out all kinds of terms and stuff that. I didn't really know. There were some things I knew. I knew they were calling for epi at times, and they were calling for calling times and resuscitations and stuff. And at one point, one of the EKG cards got driven out the out the room, and another one was brought in because apparently the battery was dead in the first one. Um, they did. There were so many people coming and going. It's like a fucking train station. It's like busy, <laughs> busy. And uh, somewhere in that must have been shift change. So, and uh, she said that uh, it's not it's not looking good. She said at that point they did give Alison multiple rounds of of blood. I don't remember it was three or four. Uh, pretty much all the medication and everything she could possibly have they had given her at that point, and they did resuscitate her three times at that point. And they were trying to get her stable enough to get her into uh, a CT and do a head-to-toe CT to try to figure out what what's going on, what's what's causing it. Which I don't know why they did head-to-toe because she came in with pain just below her ribs on the left-hand side, her belly just below the ribs. So and I don't know. But anyways, uh, they. They did get her to a point, and they had to consent to use a contrast for the CT because there might have been allergic reactions, which, yeah, allergic reactions fine and dandy, but the wife was not doing good. If you're in the hospital, I'm sure you have something against allergic reactions, so just, just give her what she needs and figure out what's going on. So they, they did eventually get her to a point where she was, was stable enough to get brought to the that doesn't mean stable, like she was just barely stable enough that they felt comfortable enough they could bring her from the x-ray room to the CT room and, and try to get a picture. Um, so I did see her roll out of the room. She was still alive. She was still alive, leaving the x-ray room. Uh, hooked up two machines, tubes coming out of her. Her arm was hanging off the stretcher. There was a little bit of blood on her, on her hands which, and stuff. And she was white, white as a ghost. Well, I knew they resuscitated her three times, and, and based on what I know, I knew it was bad. And the doctor did tell me that it was not looking good. They they did tell me that I couldn't go to the CT with her, which I would love to. But anyways, they said they had a nice, comfortable room by the in ICU. They did also say that they did they were prepping an OR for her just in case, and they did have doctors on call or coming in or already in the hospital at this point, possibly. And uh, the anesthesia team was, was getting prepped and stuff like that. 
Uh, so I went to the to the quiet room, and somebody came and said I should call somebody. I should call somebody for me just in case. And I said no, it's New Year's Eve. I don't want to bother anybody. They did eventually convince me to to call somebody. I did call Gordon, which is uh, Hayden and Holly's dad, the older two kids. And I, I talked to him. I told him what's going on. Him and him and me are pretty close. So was him and Allison were always close. Uh, we did actually work together out west for the last little bit. And uh, yeah, so I told him. And at this point, nothing was really clear. I was hoping I'd still be able to take it back home in a little while, a couple of days, a week, a month. So we discussed what we're going to do, tell the children. And at that point, they did go to the to the New Year celebration that we were supposed, all supposed to go to. So I just told them, like, they're there, they're happy right now. I don't I don't think we, we should bother them at the moment. When we know more and, and he agreed, just let them have a, a normal New Year's and we'll go from there. So uh, the doctor did come in and inform me that they did they did get some pictures from the CT. They they could see fluids in her I don't quite remember, abdomen, belly, torso, chest, wherever it might have been. And uh, but they couldn't see where it was coming from because they had to pull her out before because they thought they were losing her again. The uh, <clears throat> and then they left and they tried to figure out if there was a chance for surgery or, or whatnot. They, 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 did, they did the job. Uh, so I was in the room and I, at that point I did start. She did really didn't make me any hope. I, I think I met the surgeon at that point that was possibly going to have a look at her. And uh, based on my limited medical knowledge and what they gave me to understand, is there was not much of a chance. So I did call some other people, um, some friends and stuff. And, uh, and somebody got a hold of Andy for me, which is uh, a good friend and, and our fire chief in Shiva and Titnish. And, uh, he dropped everything and came up with his wife from Parisboro, from his family, gathering there to be with us in the hospital. And uh, right around nine, uh, one of the nurses came to me and asked me if I wanted to see her. And like, of course I wanted to see her. I wouldn't have left her side if I had the option. <clears throat> so uh, I went to see her and like I had another quick chat with, with the ICU doctor and the and the potential surgeon and a couple of nurses and. Yeah, she really didn't look good. Really didn't look good. I, I see my grandfather when I was little in a, in a, a vacant coma, and honestly, he looked better at the time than she did now. So that was pretty shitty. And uh, at that point, I, I did make the call to let the kids know, and I did talk to the doctors. And, and I guess there was a small chance we, we could break it into an OR, and uh, there was a, a, a small potential chance, but. The odds were not in her favor. It was more likely that she was going to die in the cold war, the strangers surrounded, than that she was going to make it out. So we did make the call to not pursue a surgery at this point because, as far as I was aware, they were not sure where it was coming from, the bleed that was, <clears throat> or anything, so there was really not much we could do. He had a 1% chance of keeping her alive with a surgery. But at that point, there was not much chance for her having ever a normal or dignified life. Like, there was a significant amount of time where she apparently did not have sufficient blood flow to the vital organs and therefore the brain. So. I did snap my finger in front of her eyes a couple of times and there was no reaction, no nothing. Didn't look like she blinked in forever, like her eyes were just dry and just looked like dried and cracking. Like 